Hello, this is Mona Tanjeff, past president of NCSM, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Game Changer series. Join me and my co-host, John San Giovanni, as we sit down and have conversations with emerging and established leaders about how they are changing the game in mathematics education. Gandhi said, we need to be the change that we want to see in the world. So listen as we talk to mathematics leaders who are being the change that they want to see in mathematics education. We will learn about their inspiration, perceptions, and of course, their game-changing actions. Mathematics leaders, we know that the status quo is unacceptable, so it's time to change the game. So that's right, it is time to change the game. So hello, I am Mona Tanchev, and welcome to the NCSM podcast, Learning with Leaders, the Game Changer series. Hi folks, I'm John Sanjibani uh, with Mona, I'm a co-host. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Graham Fletcher about building fact fluency through mathematical storytelling and what that does to contribute to game changing. Graham Graham Fletcher has served in education as a classroom teacher, math instructional leader, and and currently is a math specialist. One thing I know about Graham is he is continually seeking new and innovative ways to support students and teachers in their development of conceptual understanding really focusing in on elementary mathematics. He's the co-author of Building Fact Fluency, and he shares lots of resources on gfletchy.com. I don't know if you've gone there, but I use them frequently. Pretty sure every listener is familiar with the website. And there's other <laughs> things to know about Graham too, but we're gonna leave it to just those things for now. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds uh, fair. So right. anyway, thank you guys for joining us today to discuss how, how to change the game in mathematics education. So welcome. Yeah, uh, super ex- excited to be here to sit alongside you both all and kind of uh, just learn and grow in this moment and then just kind of share some thoughts and kind of work together. I'm a firm believer that all of us are smarter than one of us. So the more that we can all come together and grow and learn from each other, the better off our kids will all be. And I think that's our, our end goal. So yeah, excited to, to uh, jump in here and play for a little while. All right. Well, let's just jump in and play. Thanks, Graham, again. Um, our new series is about being a game changer. So the first thing we have to ask you is, well, what does it mean to you to to, to be a game changer? Um, to be a game changer, I, I think for me, it means not settling with the, the status quo. I think mm-hmm. things are always kind of changing, evolving as, as educators. And, and so especially in, in especially in the minds of our students. So uh, I think about how many practices from when we were all students have kind of trickled their way and still remain in our classrooms and how many of those kind of connect with students today and how many of them are kind of lost on, on our students. So again, not sticking with that status quo and kind of what can we always be doing to change, to evolve, to kind of meet the needs of our students. And it doesn't mean necessarily mean that you need to be the trailblazer or, or the creator of something. It could be that you're supporting the good work that's happening that you see that you believe in wholeheartedly. So it doesn't have to necessarily be the person that's the creator behind it, but what are you doing to, to kind of help push that, that lead uh, for your students and in the buildings that you support and work with on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, Graham, as you're sharing that, you know, it makes me think about um, being a reflective practitioner and thinking about like, why am I doing this? Is this something I've always done? And, you know, I don't necessarily have to change everything, but being mindful about my approaches and things, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and I think it, it's not like you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like we're already doing so many good practices. It's just, it could be subtle tweaks, maybe the ways that we ask questions or, or maybe the ways that we invite students into the mathematics that, that make it more accessible for them. So again, like what you just said there, John, is, is how do we become more of that reflective teacher to, to, keep, revi- to keep revising and refining our, our current craft to be better? So Graham, one thing, um... When I read your bio, I was pretty excited because your current title is what I left when I left the district, I was the math specialist. So it's a really interesting position. And I don't know if you're considered an administrator or I was like a teacher on assignment. So either way, how do you see yourself as a game changer in that role? I I think the, the game changing piece of that comes into supporting the educators that we support. So it's okay to go to a conference and have wonderful, like wicked awesome ideas that you take back to your district. And then you start asking teachers to just, oh, give this a try. But 
it's not so much the one and done, but how do we make that change? How do we make that, that great idea that we see that we believe in? How do we make it sustainable in practice? And how do we continue to lift teachers, teachers up on, on that day-to-day basis? Uh, it, it's okay to go in and model a lesson one day, but how is it that we're empowering teachers that once we leave the, cra- the classroom, they feel empowered to continue that practice? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the modeling lessons because we know that's important. But at the same time, it sometimes can be just a fragile one thing done once, right? And then we expect for the whole world to change because uh, of, of that one experience. And that's not really uh, that's not really how you make change. I mean, that's something that I've learned. And it makes me think about, you know, what have you learned? What have you learned about making change as a as, you know, change maker yourself? And more importantly, Graham, like what advice would you give others about how to lead that change? I, I think it comes back to the the, the one and dones don't nece- don't don't necessarily work in 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 my belief, and I could be wholeheartedly wrong in this, but I, I think about how is it that we make that change sustainable. So I'm thinking about how do we set up professional learning communities, and not continually changing those goals that we're setting. Mm-hmm. So if we're setting goals, how do we not keep moving the field goal posts for teachers, but keeping that work grounded in practice from a year to year basis. Uh, I think that that's that's a big thing. It's it's okay coming with new ideas and these shifts and practices, but how do we keep grounded and keep those moving from year to year and and not ch- changing all the time? Right. Well, that's, that's, I mean, I think that's an excellent point. Right. Limiting change. Right. Yeah. Identifying the thing that we want to focus on, but then actually focusing on that for more than a hot second, um, because it becomes an issue of I guess chasing your tail in some ways, right? Yeah, here we are saying game changing and we're like, well, don't change too much. But I think the change has to be (laughs) intentional and purposeful, right? Like I think that's the big thing. There's always the new hot ticket or there's always something new that, or a new fad and we jump from fad to fad to fad and, and eventually, uh, we just we kind of like just wash our teachers and all of these great ideas like I was talking with some teachers and it's like whenever you go to a PL session, you get all of these wonderful ideas. And then you go back to your classroom and you try all of the ideas at once you suck at all of them and then you go right back to the teaching practice that you were doing before. So finding those things to be intentional and purposeful with within your practice and, and really making those your, your, your goals as well. Um, I think that's that's a big piece of it. Yeah, so you mentioned there's, you know, these ideas of the one and done or that there's overload on what needs to be changed. Like in your ex- experience or in your expertise, what needs desperate change in math education? Like what's going to be that focus point f- for us as leaders to really make an impact on students today? I, one word that keeps resonating with me is, is, is coherence. Um, and so it can be coherence from both a, a teacher point of view, but it can also be coherence from, a, from the types of, of things that we use with students. Like there's so many great resources out there. And what I find teachers will be pulling from so many different places and we lose that coherence. Or it could also be from, from a standard point of view where teachers are looking at learning objectives, but they're, they're, they might be missing the, the, the key pieces of how to connect those dots between the learning. So it could be coherence between learning standards, but it could also be coherence uh, between, between the resources that we're using as well. So I think coherence is, is one of the words that, that, that's really resonating with, with me a lot here recently. That's the one thing I, I think, especially over the last two years with the, you know, the term mm-hmm. learning loss that was thrown around um, and it wasn't, there was no learning loss. It was just, there was not, not an opportunity to have the same level of learning per se, depending on what system you were in. And so the coherence was incredibly important for that work because what we found was if teams were really isolated, like grade level teams were isolated and only knowing their content, they weren't necessarily aware of what was the prerequisite knowledge the year before so that I can provide that just in time support. So I I agree, coherence is really important. And just a quick, if you have not watched your videos, As a high school teacher, I truly enjoyed watching your videos around the progressions because it really helped me understand where my where kiddos were coming from when they got to me to understand what were some of the strategies that they learned at an earlier age so that I could reinforce them with new learning at the high school level. 
So just yeah, that's out. a great example of game changing right there, <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. Helping teachers see how these ideas progress because we didn't all have access in our teacher preparation programs or whatever right, to right. Like know the math deeply and, and you know, be able to be coherent. And coherence is challenged in other ways, right? From quarantines to, uh, you know, in-person to virtual learning back to in-person, like there's a lot of things challenging us today for coherence. And then that challenge was before the pandemic. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I think about it, like, like when, when working with teachers, I think a lot of the times as math leaders, we, we really focus on those grade level standards because those are the learning objectives for one year. But if you teach fourth grade, you don't teach fourth grade. What you teach are 10 and 11 year olds who function at like a first grade through like maybe a seventh grade level as That's per right. the standards say. So it becomes just like what you were saying. Uh, it, is, it becomes imperative that student, that teachers understand where the math is coming from, where it is in that specific quote unquote grade level, but then also where it needs to go as well. So yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. Uh, and and I'm, I'm really glad you say that. It, it reminds me of a friend and mentor who hired me some many years ago. She's been saying, she said since the late nineties, you have to know the year behind you and the year in front of you, right? For your teachers, where the, where the students are coming from and where they're going, et cetera. So, um, Talking about your videos, that's definitely game-changing work, but I want, I want to get to you some of your newest work around a topic that we've approached in the United States the same way for about 120 years. Um, <laughs> and, and so to, to speaking of, and we've complained about it for 120 years in the United States, and yet we continue to do the same thing. So listener, if you don't know what we're talking about, well, here we go. Um, it seems basic, but there's really nothing about basic about learning basic facts, right? And um, that's something that ref desperately needs game changing. Um, so tell me, why do you think fact fluency continues to be an area of concern uh, for districts? And you know, how can we as math leaders you know, support this work moving forward? So I, I can kind of share where, where uh, a blind spot is, was definitely, and I had a huge blind spot. And, and, and maybe if you're a math lead uh, in your district or, or a coordinator, you have the same blind spot as I, as I had, and I continue to continue to evolve and change is uh, for quite some time now, if you're a math lead, you, we have, I'll say collectively, we have been pushing this idea of, of fluency is, is this idea of accuracy, of efficiency, and flexible. And those are three terms that I've been pushing for kind of years and years and years. Like we need those three terms. But when I go back and I, and I look at that years and years of research, so looking at principles to action, adding it up, it talks about being efficient, accurate, and flexible. But the part that I was really missing was context. And so it talks about students being able to solve contextual and mathematical problems. So uh, I love number talks. And those of you who have been, who have been in this, this profession for, for, 10, for 10 years, you've seen how much number talks has really helped us for so many years. And just a, a quick story where, where I really kind of pulled the veil back on my own blind spot is being in a first grade classroom uh, we'd be using make a 10 strategy. Uh, that was the number string that we were working on. Kids were adding nine plus seven. They would take one from the seven, give it to the nine to make a 10, and they would have 10 plus six, 16. Great. I'm jacked up. I'm super pumped because kids can make a 10 when they're adding nine plus seven. But not even 10 minutes later, when I would give them a contextualized word problem, uh, and I'd have that same nine and seven in it, they would revert right back to counting on or, or they'd revert back to drawing all, counting all. And what I realize is a lot of the time we're teaching fluency void of context. So it's, it's basically naked numbers. And, and what the research has shared, what we were talking about before is the research is saying that is that fluency, fact fluency and fluency in general should be an outcome of meaningful problem solving not a precursor to problem solving. I, I know a lot of the times what we talk about is, and I'm guilty of saying, hey, uh, learn your facts and then let's go do some problem solving or learn your facts and then let's go and relearn those deep, meaningful relationships around numbers. But it should be through the problem solving, the relationships of numbers, that fact fluency is the outcome. So I, I kind of wonder, and, and I just ask like those, those educators that are, that are leading the charge in their, in their district, are we looking at building fluency void of context or is it an outcome of meaningful problem solving? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I think that 
that meaningful context is really important. Making connections as well and being coherent is something you brought up. And, and to that point, um, positioning you know problems so that students can see the connections and relationships between problems, I think, is is something that we're not always, we don't always do well or know that we need to do right. And then unpacking that. So a student, to your point, solves nine plus seven. Then we do nineteen plus seven. Then we do twenty nine plus seven. Like when is the conversation about hey how are these the same and how are they different and and you know it's a different type of story I think Graham but a really really good one to have or to to, to share and what I think's beautiful about that is that as I'm listening to you explain the, those examples John is is you're you're kind of making the connection for students like we're not just learning our facts and then putting them on a shelf it's those relationships with basic facts that builds students up for the understanding that they need, whether they're playing around with multi-digit or they're playing around with decimals. And those properties, those relationships that we build with fact fluency are scalable all the way through, through K-12. But a lot of the times we don't learn our facts in these meaningful ways. So the properties and the relationships are kind of standalone skills that are just applied to one idea and not across the whole gamut. Yeah, that's actually a really nice point as well, Graham. And I think that's a game changing moment for many of us in the profession is recognizing or helping fourth graders, fifth graders, et cetera, see that nine plus seven and nine tenths plus seven tenths have yeah. a relationship, right? And you actually do, you don't have to like forget everything you already know. And now like, oh my gosh, there's a decimal point. What do I do, right? It's the same idea. I'm making a hole and I have some left over, right? And um, I think it goes to coherence, but to your point as well, it certainly goes to storytelling and context and all the things that we need some some work on. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And also thinking about, I think many of us are able to make that connection between the distributive property and all the way up into, into high school as well. But that distributive property starts when we start playing around with our basic facts for like knowing your, your eight times tables and, 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 and then also using the associate. It's just so scalable. And, and I think that's the big piece. It comes back to those relationships for sure. Agreed, yep. I would also add that as a leader, our job as part of that professional learning is to highlight those connections and where we can find them through instruction, through our tasks, through the experiences we provide for students. Um, we have to intentionally look for those because I've been in lessons where like the lesson itself was, was fine. It was a missed opportunity to make those connections, right? So like when you're, when you're working with with teams or with teachers, like you have got to be really purposeful about helping them make the connections so that they're not seeing them, seeing the facts and the context as two separate things that they're- Yeah, having. you know, something yeah, that dawns really on me there, Mona, yeah. is that to be a game changer earlier, even that Graham talked about, like as a classroom teacher, I can be reflective and think about like, how did I make connections today? How did I lift up the distributor property? Yeah. And when I miss it, I don't have to beat myself up about it, right? That I just need to make sure I think about it tomorrow. Yeah. So last thing I want to kind of highlight here is that we know that game changing in mathematics education is about realizing equity in our field. Um, yet some might think that certain topics like basic fact instruction is void of equity issues. So what would you say about that? Oh, uh, I, I think about how, how do how do we make so we'll do, and we'll stay in that idea of basic facts, but how do we make that uh, accessible for all of our students? So I think when we just drop a couple naked numbers up on the on the board, that immediately will sh so many of our third and fourth grade, or even second, first and second graders, will shut down out of fear of being wrong. So I, I think about how uh, one of the things that um, I've done I've spent a lot of time here in recent years with Tracy Zager and and thinking about. Uh, number talk images. So showing images and allowing students to see apples and saying, hey, how do you find out how many apples are here? How many red apples? How many green apples? And what's beautiful about that is by showing quantity in that context really invites so many students when they see those numbers, when if they just saw the naked numbers, they would shy away from the conversation. And so by just showing a picture and asking students, what do you notice? What do you wonder? How many? It really invites so many more students to have a conversation about what they notice. And every single student, no matter of their age or ability, has something to bring to the table in, in that conversation. And I can't tell you how many times I've actually just dropped naked numbers on a board and said, how many? And you know as well as I do that it's the same four kids every single time that want to answer. Now, we need those four kids during an observation. 
<laughs> but, but, but that that might be it, can, right? Like we'll, that, we'll that, call them in faster when we're being observed. As a matter of fact, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> ab- absolutely, but it's it's those four kids that we take on the math journey. And what about the other 21, 22 kids in our class that never had an opportunity? Or when we base basic facts on speed, I think about how many of our multilingual students or some of our, our brightest students who might be slower processing, they never have an opportunity to advocate for their own learning in, in the classroom. And so I think, how is it that we can just allow that time for certain students to maybe slow their roll and not snowball us with everything that's on their mind when they're excited, but then how is it that we can also slow down the mathematics to invite more students into the conversation? Because I think a lot of the times when we look at a pacing guide, we're always trying to go through that checklist. I got to do this. I got to do this. But slowing down to go fast later. Yeah. And, you know, especially when it comes to basic facts, pacing guides can be a damning uh, part of equity, right? Because we hold every student to the same growth progression. And that's just not not how it works. Um, So that's not how it works. That's not how it works, right? And for what it's worth, I mean, I think back to learning facts. As an adult, I thought I learned them in two weeks, but my mom <clears throat> has told me it took a couple more years than that. And the truth <laughs> is, before you laugh, every Here's listener the truth. just did, including Mona and Graham, it's truth for all of us, right? Looking back when you're 45 or 29 like Mona, you think that, hey, um, I learned them in a couple of days, but the fact is most most kids never have. Um, and maybe we need to come to grips with some of, some of those things, right? Um, so Graham, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, one of the things you said was to be a game changer, you, you don't have to settle for the status quo. And that doesn't matter what level um, your, your work is in terms of math education. And so um, we can all make a change, even with things as quote unquote basic as basic facts. Anything else you want to add for some final words before we wrap up today? As I shared at the beginning, just all of us are smarter than one of us. And and I think just even if you're in a building and sometimes, you know, you can always reach out and find somebody who wants who will continue to keep pushing you to do better. So surround yourself around people that you want to be like. And I think that, that that's a big piece that's helped me. I stand on the shoulders of giants, as I'm sure the three of us do. So just continuing to lift each other up in this practice. I think that's the biggest thing. And I think together we can all be game changers for sure. Excellent, Graham. And you know, Mona, correct me if I'm wrong, but that theme has come up quite a bit from all of our other game changers, right? Yes. Surround yourself with people that inspire you to move forward and, and to, to grow as, as a professional. So to continue to grow. And I like what you said about lifting up, that you have to continue to lift each other up through the process, because this is not an easy thing to make some of these instructional shifts or changes in math education. We need each other yeah. for that. Well, and you can lose confidence with things like basic facts, like I should know how to teach this well. And 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 sometimes like you don't have to know everything and give yourself some grace. Yep. Um, but along those lines, Graham, thanks as always. Great talking with you. And uh, Mona, I look forward to talking to you next time on the okay. podcast. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. We hope you have been inspired by this bold mathematics leadership conversation and will tune into our podcast series each month. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. You can learn more about NCSM Leadership in Mathematics Education and our upcoming professional learning events on the NCSM website at mathedleadership.org. You can also follow NCSM on Twitter at mathedleaders using the hashtag NCSMBold. Thanks again.